Well, uh, first of all, let me say that I'm uh, so grateful to you for bestowing uh, this honor on me uh, today. Uh, it draws me uh, nearer to Canada, a country I've always admired, and if things had worked out a little differently in my life, I would have moved here 20 years ago, so I'm having a little regret. <laughs> uh, You've kindly honored me for work I've done in the past, but although I can just see the grim reaper on the distant horizon, I'm ever more involved in my studies and writing, uh, and this is because uh, the world is involved in a really a double revolution that's taking place today. And, I want to be around to see how it turns out. Uh, this is a time when the world has urbanized, as you all know. Uh, two years ago, rough estimate said that more than half the people in the world live in cities. Uh, and these cities to which people are moving are really unlike the cities we know in the past. To give you an example, London, a century ago, was the world's biggest city, and it was 5.9 million people. Uh, there are, our best estimate is there are 35 million people in Mexico City, and something like the same in Mumbai. It takes, as I recently found in trying to drive across Mexico City all day, you start in the morning and you leave the other end of the city uh, when the sun, sun is starting to go down. Uh, cities that dwarf the imagination, uh, imagination we have of places like Toronto or Berlin or Paris. Um, we don't know what it means for, to live in cities on this scale and particularly what it means for people to come into them so rapidly and in, in such density. You know, if those 35 million people in uh, Mexico City were spread out as the same density of Toronto, the city would be about 130 miles uh, across. But you're getting masses of numbers of people um, packed together rapidly in one place. This is also the time when the world's political economy is being rapidly transformed. Again, another cliche, by new technologies, high finance, and global markets. When I started studying this transformation, I thought that this applied only to the smallest kind of elite slice of the population, people who did computer programming in Silicon Valley uh, or who uh, wangled and dealt with cash, uh, high finance in uh, the city of London and in Wall Street. But now we know that these changes, which have begun in the 90s, have affected almost all spheres um, of labor, that um, um, what's called FIRE, which is uh, high finance, in, uh, uh, insurance, creative industries, real estate, that the pursuit of these activities is really driving the global economy. Even if you're a cleaner in Wall Street, your fortunes depend not on the labor market, but on the capital market. And this is one reason that what we're seeing that marks this phase of development, economic development off from the past, is again, a very rapid and intensive shift from manufacturing to services uh, driven by finance. 
Now, what connects these two revolutions? A third cliche, inequality. And, uh, you know, it's true of cliches that uh, sometimes they are cliches because they're true. <laughs> and uh, in this case, as cities grow in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, they're becoming, as you can imagine, more polarized in terms of uh, extremes of poverty and wealth. Something that when researchers like me began to chart this urban growth, we didn't expect at all. We thought they'd be mostly poor. But in fact, by measures like uh, the Gini coefficient, which is a, a rather dubious but uh, commonly used measure of inequality, the fastest growth in the Gini coefficient is in places like uh, Mumbai, Shanghai, Sao Paulo. Um, that is to say that they are places in which masses numbers of poor people are coming in, but also which are generating enormous sources of wealth thanks to the other, uh, uh, the other transformation from which that wealthy slice in the developing world is profiting. For us in the West, inequality is uh, something that is a little more complicated. The numbers of poor people are not increasing in large numbers. The numbers of wealthy people are very minute Although the 1% owns a lot, it is 1%. The big story here is the stagnation of the middle class. And that's something that sets off our experience of the new economy from uh, people in the developing world. And also poses a problem uh, for the ways in which these extremes can be um, moderated. You know what I'm talking about. It's more and more difficult to um, find places to live, even in Canada, which is not so scarred by this dual revolution as American or British cities are. But you're still beginning to find, to feel its effects, as you will undoubtedly discover when you try to buy your first flat or look for a job which thousands of people are also looking for. So three cliches, but three realities. And the question is, that is urban growth, the transformation of modern capitalism, and the connection between the two in terms of inequality. And it poses a question about whether this dual revolution is sustainable. And particularly for us in Western cities, uh, can anything be done about the lethargic fortunes of the middle class, which is, um, uh, uh, I mean, it may seem odd to think that this is a more important problem than poverty in Western cities. Uh, I don't say it is, but I say it's a kind of problem for which we don't really have very good solutions. If we have the will, we know what we, want, we can do about poverty. But even if you want to do something to increase the fortunes of the middle class, what can you do? At a commencement, it's traditional to tell you that the world is your oyster or that anything po is possible if you strive hard enough and so on. And I have too much respect for your intelligence to repeat these lies. Uh, but I do think something can be done. And that is because no supreme being has decreed that the economy has to be the way it currently is. In fact, this is a dysfunctional economy 
for the vast majority of, of people. Equality makes it dysfunctional and extremely volatile because the wealth that's generated at the top uh, is not stabilized wealth. It's short term, very short term in some cases, uh, and it's a wealth which is con uh, continually being undone as well as, as done. Um, nobody has decreed things need to be this way. The same is true in cities. Nobody has decreed that a city has to have 35 million people, you know, as the Chinese are themselves now waking up to, that there is a reasonable size for a city if only you want to make it. So rather than tell you anything is possible if you strive hard enough, I think that uh, there are things that you will have to do to make this world uh, livable. And in part they mean taming uh, effects of urban growth, but they mean a real attack on inequality, not in the form that somebody like Thomas Piketty rep, uh, recommends, which is through taxation, but through actually outlawing large, uh, uh, large swaths of economic activity. And as I've gotten old, I've become very far left, left wing. I think, you know, certain forms of banking should be crimes. It's not that they should be curbed, they should be ended. And we can do that. Nothing is decreed that things have to be as they are. So, my message is to you, I'm not, I hope I live long to see you deal with uh, this dub, dual revolution, because you'll have to deal with it in some way, and I hope you deal with it well. Let me just conclude by thanking you again for this great uh, honor you bestowed on me, arousing my Canadian nostalgia once again. Thank you very much. <laughs>